Roberto Perez is a Cuban permaculturist and environmental educator who is involved in the work to develop urban food growing and the special period to increase Cuba's food security. Using permaculture techniques, which, search, which seeks sustainable solutions by following nature's patterns. Roberto attributes much of the success of Cuba's urban agriculture and food security to the introduction of permaculture by a group of Australian trainers during the early periods of the Cuban crisis. The city of Havana now produces over 60% of its fruit and salad vegetables within the city and perma-urban areas thanks to the permaculture approach. Roberto is the Environmental Education and Biodiversity Conservation Program Director of Antonio Nunez Jimenez Foundation for Nature and Humanity, the oldest environmental organization in Cuba. So welcome, Roberto. Hello, everybody. Um, first, I would like to thanks the organizers of this conference for having the opportunity. I happen to be in, in another conference in Cape Breton, and the organizers, when they heard that it was like in the region, they did everything to bring me here, and, and thanks to you. My, my presentation today, I would like to share with you the, the experience of, of the last two decades in Cuba. And I'm going to use the term sustainable agriculture. I, in, even in Latin America, we use the term agroecology because some of the uh, dimensions that, that, that we are pursuing are not necessarily covered by the term organic farming. I know that the true organic farmers, they have a lot of awareness and they know what is uh, like organic agriculture. No? But the idea is like we will want to fix some points. So basically, in my presentation, I will be covering three aspects, like sustainable agriculture on the natural level, urban agriculture in Cuba as a system with some like context and, and hard numbers, and like the influence and a little bit of history of the permaculture we see these bigger movements. So I want to, to change that data, 20 years of experience of sustainable agriculture, and basically these are right now two features of Havana and of Cuba the old vintage cars of the 50s, and the empire gardens. Next. This is some context. I, I know that uh, quite a few Canadians come to you, except to, technically speaking, more than one million per year, especially in February, and it's very cold here. But these are some of, of the like context. Just to give you an idea, it's a slightly smaller surface than Newfoundland. But we have like 11 million people living there, and the tropic goes inside, and so it's a humid, or semi-humid tropical climate with a heavy marine influence, and it's an archipelago. It's not, it's a one big main island, but we have many other islands. And I'm telling you because many of the Canadians will go to one of these, these little kids, Cayo Coco, Cayo Guillermo, Cayo Lago, and so on. Just to give you a, also a little bit of context, everybody is agreed that the surface of the, of the country when Columbus arrived in 1492 was more than 93% covered by forests. This is one of the possible explanations that before the spreading of the big sugar cane boom in, in the beginning of the 19th century, still there were more than 75%, I prefer that 80%, Covered by forests, by the turn of the century, there were more than half of the of the surface were covered by forests. But by 1959, 86 percent of the native ecosystems were totally wiped out by this plantation agriculture. I don't want to give you like a, a lot of historical context, but we have our colonial period and our post-republic period and the ideas of the last 50 years. Yes. Mm. But this is just to give you an example. In this case, it's actually the use of vegetable biodiversity, just to prove like how boring we can be, no? And 
It's like we know that there is a quarter of a million of, of species of vegetables. Fungus is a separate kingdom. Of these, more than 30,000 species are edible. They have been used on, on human feeding 7,000 species, but right now there's only 120 that are cultivated. Out of these, nine species account for 75% of the food, and three species account for more than half of the food that we consume. Just to give you an idea of the use of diversity, especially because one of the, of the ideas that, that we have in Cuba is like of our a biodiversity, 58% is endemic, is native. Even with the many species that they were extinct, we still have like a, a huge picture. Some people would think that Cuba, okay, you know, we were people, subsistence agriculture. That was not true. Okay, we have a period. We have our own green conventional revolution for for almost 40 years. We were a country that even was a plantation for export base as soon as the 1500s. So Cuba was in the in the big things uh, like the tobacco, coffee, uh, sugar cane, and after that, so many things uh, were added, like citrus and, and different things. So in our case, the only difference is that our machinery were Soviet staff, very inefficient two kilometers on the liter of diesel. But our agriculture was have like this period of totally green revolution, a plantation expert. We have used to have 3,000 tractors and more use of chemicals than even many states of US. So just to give you an idea that. I think you'd be better off pushing the mic ahead a bit because we're getting a big, bit of an echo back here and your voice is loud enough that we can okay. hear you. I think that's why. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. And so just to give you this idea, and of course all of these agree, the revolution is totally linked to the use of massive amounts of fuel oil. As much as 13 million tons of fuel oil were used in, in Cuba in the 80s, of which more than 75% account for the agriculture. In the case of that, we were exporting a lot of toxic things, rum, cigars, coffee, and we were importing and most of, of the food. That was basically the economy that we have. Next. So as a result of that, there were a lot of problems and threats to agriculture. That's another thing. Now you're tropical. You can grow all year round. He was a very fertile country. Well, you know, yes and no. The, the agricultural surface of the country that is a, a little bit more than uh, 6 million uh, six million and a half of hectares, it's like affected. The land that they took is a main environmental problem of the country. So 75% of the of the arable land, of the considered arable land, are affected by one or more process of land degradation. Even we have a natural product against the certification, just to give you an idea, like how this uh, conventional system was so destructive, and especially when you apply to it, like relatively uh, delicate in balanced tropical soils. If you add that, the drought, that is another big environmental problem recognized with that, and the big impacts of the climate change in the agriculture, you also will understand that our starting point was not that easy. Neither. And then the economy. What happened to us was basically that we lost everything. On, of our training partners, our markets. Practically, in, in, in a couple of days, there was no Soviet Union, there was no Islam. And our system was totally, totally forced to reduce the use of the very uh, high inputs that we have. So that's basically, I think that it was the main reason that we have to do what I'm going to show to you. Technically, you know, there is no oil, there is no oil. There is no wood. That's typically as that. And our GDP went down by 70%. Technically, we were, and physically, we were starving. There are many ways to describe that, but it was like that. And even if you're ready to give your life or everything and to resist, you have to eat everything. The food is an absolute, absolute basic human need. Okay? So I'm going to try to 
what happens, you know, like E Cuba in in the six is a word two agreed that reform that limits the maximum size of a private farm to 27 hectares. Okay? Of we right now, what we have of these individual farmers occupy 50% of the land. Then we have the cooperative of agricultural production that occupies a little bit roughly more than 11%, and that for these 40 years of conventional agriculture, the huge state farm a system is totally conventional operation, occupied 76% of the total land. By 1990, 127% was given to this basic units of cooperative production. And last year, there was another 10% of the new land delivered to the people. So more than 200,000 hectares were technically given to people. Why given? Because what we do is have use of fruit. So people are allowed to access the land and their resources like water. But what they do is they don't, you know, the ownership and the property of their resources, they use the product of that land for what we call right now lifetime use of it. And these are some numbers of the hectares delivered for coffee, for tobacco, for forestry farm. And so right now, the state owned conventional, there is some conventional life not reviewer, but it accounts for less than 20% of the total power land. So our situation is very, very different than most countries in the planet. So when this conventional agriculture is totally tricky and cornered by I really believe that these other systems of agriculture are sustainable and a lot more efficient, especially when they are not heavily subsidized by different taxes here. So I'm going to try to uh, talk about some of the sustainable agriculture achievements in terms of reforestation because I think that the moment that the agriculture gets in touch again of the environmental concerns, then we, have, we, we, we are in trouble again. And right now, in every country, right now, agriculture is accounting for more than 30% of emissions, more than 35% of consumption of energy. And some of the things that are really, really damaging uh, some of the, of the environmental, uh, you know, variables in, in many places. So, between 1959 and 2010, we increased our forest by 13%. Right now, we are, this 27% is 3 million of hectares. That's the size of Salvador, a little country in Central America. Just to give you an idea, that if we try to combine the agriculture with the uh, agroforestry and we try to come back and make the systems uh, more environmentally friendly, there is some space to bring back the forest and to offset some of the emissions involved with the agriculture. We are very proud of that. And I have to say that nobody gave us carbon credits, no IMF money, no more money. We did it. In terms of you know, one of the things that a lot of people say, oh, what about the fertility of the soils? What, what, what are you gonna do with that, no? In our case, the application and the production of organic fertilizer produced per year surpassed eight million tons. And they are applied in millions of acres. It can be compost, worm casting. Cachaza, which is a, like a bioverse that we produce with sugar cane ballast, is very low in nitrogen, but it's very good to create and to bring carbon to the soil. Different forms of organic matter, including like the fertile irrigation and the wastewater of sugar cane and other effluents that before they were uh, pollutants and they were dumped in human base and, and the ocean. And right now everybody's hoping for that because it's excellent for, for the fertile irrigation of that. And of course, this is our tractors right now. More than 100,000 pairs of oxen that they are working on that. And this is part of what we call a appropriate technology. And an oxen doesn't need a diesel or gas. Doesn't need spare parts. It doesn't compact the soil. It produces manure that we use to, uh, to fertilize. We can feed this oxen in, in marginal land. And if work gets to work, we can eat the oxen. We can only eat a tractor. Okay? <laughs> but another thing that I think that is very important that it really gives a human dimension to 
do the agriculture. You know, you can probably in a tractor can work for, for 10 hours. But with an oxen after four hours, you know, they just stop. They put it in the soil and they say, that's it, kill me. <laughs> but this is another idea of how our dimensions are, and, and, and the words that we're living. If with an oxen, you can really put any any little uh, application uh, things to do that you can do the same. It's not that far, and it's not that far to do. Another big achievement, in my opinion, it was the incorporation of this sustainable agriculture that involved, you know, organic farming, biodynamics, permaculture, intensive French techniques, and all the history of this beautiful movement that you are part in the university curriculum. So you want agronomics instead of learning 900 pages of pesticides, tries to learn what we do. So, and this was like a, a very, very big thing because it allows to recycle more, most of our agronomies. They received some, you know, conventional assistance like that, but at least this important part of the agricultural production is present on the curriculum. Some of the prices that you know very well, that they don't know the price, the price is a big one. Uberto Rios Labrada received last year from the hands of Obama, the Goldman Prize. And the, our international, we say organic agriculture event and agroecology, have, we do it once every three years, and normally it goes to 5,000, 6,000, 4,000 people that will go there from all Latin America and, and different parts of it. And the movement that we call Campesino to Campesino, that means that there is a grassroots movement that is constantly promoting sustainable and organic and low of the next one. Next. In, I'm going to talk now about urban agriculture. I was asked to talk about. Uh, there were two periods for the urban agriculture. One period when we were, we had no food. People just took over and they started to make this subsistence agriculture. It can be grow bananas in a full building. It can be have a, you know, cassavas and sweet potatoes growing in very poor soils or in parterres in, in the middle of the city because there was no food. But after 1995, this system was Totally more specialized and above for market and consumption. Some heard that just you know the agriculture, the urban agriculture in Cuba is not like poor people transition systems. It occupies almost 15 percent of the agricultural surface in the country, and I'm talking because our country is considered 75 percent urban. It employs that amount of people. And it produces more than 4 million tons per year of food. We think the Cuban cities are according to what UN go organize. But I can tell you that the decision makers and urban planners finally recognize this urban agriculture as something necessary for the city. We have to become the carbon. If we have to have green areas, if we have to have, we have to be to have some kind of production. Right now our main focus is in the very urban systems. So the, the, I will explain you that they, they are built around the cities that are considered this urban agriculture with different impacts. And the quality of this agriculture, by default, you cannot, it's, it's totally suicidal to use any chemicals within a, an urban perimeter. So our agriculture is chemical free, of course, but it's also low input, low emission, low energy, and socially, socially responsible. Just to give you an idea, the urban producers make an average of four minimum wage. Sometimes they do more, sometimes they do less. But apart from that, in a country like Cuba, when people spend 80% of their income in food, they have food. So they save a lot of money. It's clean money for their pockets. This is the geographical bridge of the country. This is Havana City, 2.2 million people, 727 square kilometers. But then we have a belt of 10 kilometers in the provincial capital. We have 168 municipalities with belts of 5 kilometers. And then every town will have like some form of urban agriculture. So it's a natural system, totally organized. I don't like the word model because we break the model every day. We have been reorganizing that every five years. But this is an origin that is very, very comprehensive. In terms of people involved, that I think is a very, very interesting 
I would like to remark the number of retired people. So they, these people that they have a knowledge of how to produce food, they led the way in the 90s and right now are still a very, very important component of the urban agricultural system. We level technicians, professionals, university level, the level of women, and see that maybe our number of young people is not as big as we, we want it. That's basically because, you know, Cuba, education is free, they're purpose in the university and doing all things. But we really, really want to increase that number. Next. Press. Again. This is the Cuban flagship of urban agriculture, the organic And you heard about that word, but everybody knows what a hydroponic is. Basically, there were like 10 or 12 hydroponic in Havana. And when we ran out of money, we ran out of money for nutrient solutions and uh, for the operation, the pumps, and there were blackouts. And somebody had the idea, let's get rid of that sand and let's put some compost there. Of course, the plants grow beautifully and a lot of it. Uh, powerfully, so no more hydroponics, and we say organic This is the number of units, the area in hectares, and the production. Uh, it's a flagship because it's a, like an investment program. Like people can have like small cooperative for like it can be like also a government program and people make a lot of money. But the yields are between 15 and 70 kilograms per square meter per year. You know, not even Monsanto can say that. Of course, we have the climate in our side. We were producing all year round. We changed that substrate uh, twice a year. You know, this is this this will be supported with the same infrastructure system, but it's a very highly productive. One thing, all that you will see there will be leaf vegetables. Why? Because they are short term and because they are perishable and because it, it makes a lot of sense economically to have that walking distance from the consumer. Press? Not press. That's it. A, a intensive gardens is anything that is bigger than 1,000 square meters. They can be collected, but they can also be individual. And I think that this is a very important thing because in a city like Havana, when many buildings collapse and things like that, we have this space that we call the transitory space. That means if you are not building anything, if there are problems, why not use provisionally some soil for urban agriculture. And then, when you have the money to build something, okay, we stop that. So the production is more than one million tons right now on, on these uh, units. You will see different. So a little bit more uh, leaf vegetables, but that will be combined with some fruit and root vegetables, and even some other called staple food, like sweet potato that is turned turn. Because it doesn't make too much sense to have they not occupy for too long. You know, in tropical season, we can choose that. Because if we grow taro root, the soil is occupied one year. If we grow cassava or yuca, the soil will be occupied for eight months. But we can choose, say, let's, let's have radish that is 28 days. Because we can do that all year round. We can scale different. Okay? And the allotments and the value, this is a basically the, what, what is happening in that very <coughs> urban areas. It can be even rooftop gardens, balconies, front gardens, anything that is smaller than 800 square meters. Of that, we have more than half a million, and the production is more than 2 million tons. You know, it can be bigger or it can be smaller, but the characteristic of that, that this is half family based or collective systems which is very different. And in Cuba you will see that people will have separate allotments. If there are five people working here, they will collectively design and grow the uh, and work in the place and they will share afterwards according to the number of hours work or other things. It's not that we, we don't have enough resources to repeat to be redundant water and pathway because we we're losing time and money. And then Okay. The other thing is like, unlike the, the presentation that was before me, eh, there is no any problem in Cuba and urban agriculture to have animals. 
And these are real numbers in terms of eggs, tons of meat, of poultry, bad dogs, whales, and, and different roasting, rabbits, edible guinea pigs, goats, African sheep, pork, you know, the idea, and, and you know that after Canada, Cuba have the second best, even better than the US, uh, levels of health. Our uh, life expectancy is 70, 78 years, and our birth uh, in natality is, is better than the US, like it's, it's less than, like, than six. So to have animals in the city doesn't kill anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I think it's, it's very good. Our human index development is more than 0 0.8, okay? So I don't know where this myth came that animals are bad in human sanitation and things like that, especially in a country that loves pets and animals. And there are plenty of other things, you know. So, but one of the most important things that were bad, and I need to explain to you first, that when we were having problems of food, we were having problems of vitamin B and lack of protein. And this is easy protein, especially for Cubans that when you show them tofu, they get a little bit skeptical. What's that? You know? And even when it, we eat tons of beans and things like that, but it was absolutely necessary to produce that. The other thing is that once that you have the animals in, in a cycle in the system, you are able to use some products that are wasted. You know, you know uh, what you normally have to get rid of it or compose it, you just give it to the animals. And after that, you have a, an amazing amount of nitrogen in the form of manure, urine, a hair, and, and all of different things that it really makes. And also, we say that we hire the animals to work for us. So if you don't have animals, and you don't have machinery, you are the animal. You have to bend and work and do that. But if I say the chickens, OK, work for me, clean this part. If I say, and, and the animals are doing like different roles in the systems. It's something that it really, really have worked. But the other thing is that you can really uh, have that in like small patios and small facilities that the amount of food that you get planting lettuce in that little space. So there are different advantages and disadvantages, but the most important thing is that our system is not really integrated between plants and animals. This is a supporting infrastructure. In this case, it's very hard for you to see it, but we have a geographic information system that's the, the National Office of Urban Agriculture. It's divided on farms that are totally dedicated to produce seeds. They actually even places that are only dedicated to produce seedlings in a system that we have like a chain system. Why? Because for new farmers, one of the most discouraging things is what the moment of the transplant, the moment of, of, of the seedlings, are, you can go, go there and say, okay, give me 5,000 seedlings of lettuce, you know. You come with the kids, with 20 people, and you organize that system. It's a, it's a support infrastructure. There are centers that they produce only uh, biofertilizers. There are utilities that are considered excellent. And, and the other thing is this, that in Cuba, the, the bio preparations are, is, is, it was a big thing. Why? Because in the very beginning, the first two years, we didn't have even money or even it wasn't a technically illegal to get some bio products and things like that because of the blockade. We lost a lot of things due to the pests. But technically, what we did in the very beginning was to raise the enemies of the pests and we release it to the human fields. Urban agriculture, apart from what I explained, there are more than 7,000 centers to produce organic fertilizer. This is the, the production per year of compost. According to the Institute of Soil, I can tell you here that it's 16,000 tons in the cities only. Using, you know, uh, like my products and, and, and the garbage. The garbage of the humans is 75% compostable because we reuse a lot and we have very low production of plastics. Things like that. And of course, we have here horse cars that they, and a and lot of animal traction that is an extra sources of that. Next. This is a production of worm casting. 
Basically, we use California red, it's semi affected, uh, but we also use the Africa, the Ufilus of Henia, that was brought to Cuba by the slave, and you can see right now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's slightly under 7,000 dogs, but you know that when you have very compost, you don't have to apply lots because it's highly concentrated and you that dispersed in, in, the, in the year. Next. Next. Be present. In the terms of the seeds, like last year, the minimum, we, we say that in terms of diversity, it's like to, to one of these places, they need to have minimum 10 species. But right now, in their basic production of 22 species and 40 varieties locally adapted. And these are tons of seeds, like for root, for leaf vegetables, for flowers, and in 280 specialized seed farms. So these farms, they only produce seeds. And this is an ad value product that these people are, you know, they are highly made by the government and by different people. And the production in 2009, it was more than 11 tons of seeds. You know, when you check that, the number of seeds there is a very big amount. Okay, uh, in terms of biocontrol, that's the centers for the reproduction of endomophagoids and endomophagoids. It's a very funny name, but that's how we call it. So there are lines of insects, nematodes, fungus, bacteria. You don't have to leave Monsanto to produce between. You can make the in a plastic drum. You can have, you know, I, I'm preaching to a convergent here. But I, I think that this is a very, very important thing to establish level, levels of predator prey in the fields and minimize the thresholds of economical damage. That's basically what allowed us, like if by the same year, to have decent yields. And no worry for them. This is a production of biological, biopesticides and other means. So this is in terms of the tons, more than, I'm talking about 3,000 tons, and the application in the numbers of hectares. So we treat, we, uh, according to, and we are responsive, it doesn't mean that we have to apply this biological meat every year. If something happens, you apply a little bit more. And then you see, you see that when they're a good year, the necessity for application is not that big. But in the, in the bad years, we, we apply a biological meat in more than one million hectares. Only for ever agriculture and a different meat. So, no, go back. In the example of like, the commercialization and the trade, it's true that our main goal is to feed the human people. So we send directly uh, to that, and there is a network on that. And in the case of urban agriculture, there is a, basically you can sell in the street, it's a good battery, you can sell in your in your plot, but there are different places of urban agriculture that you can have to pay only 1% of taxes. So the idea is since it's a social function, it's not heavily taxed, and um, we don't have any interest to take out the middle players on the contrary. We want the middle players as many as possible in. But that's the idea because it's a social goal. So everywhere you see like places, even in every block of Cuba. And the other thing is that we have observed that there's no competition between the urban producers and the, and the farms nearby, the local farmers, because there is a specialization. The farmers do more staple food. They do more, you know, cassava, okra, I think that takes more time. While these people are selling technically, you know, leaf vegetables that are very fresh. Why, the, you know, in a country that you don't have like a lot of transportation, a lot of refrigeration, for a farmer that lives 200 kilometers from Havana, when he takes his lettuce to the market, 30% is it's perishable and it's not, it looks ugly. So this is something that can be perfectly accomplished by the urban, more urban farms, while the rest produce things, you know, jam, potatoes. And there are so many fruit trees, there are so many specializations, <coughs> tropical diversity, that there is no need to compete. And of course, in the peak season, everybody, and the competition is good because it decreases the prices and it's good for the people that are buying. <laughs> we think all of that 
I would like to take some minutes to talk about that in the permaculture. What's the purpose in permaculture within that system? I would like to say that the permaculture came to you on Saturday. day. We were given a clean slate, like an opportunity to contribute to this big system. But there were the Cuban farmers and they were doing a lot of growing for many, many years. And there was an amazing movement of people. And you know that permaculture is not that amazing as, you know, people that they just go to. So basically, our goal was trying to create sustainable human settlements and try to increase the quality of the design for a conventional organic you have like more diverse, for example, if the, if the temperature in that rock by, by, by 1 p.m. would be 60 degrees Celsius, why not paint it in white to reflect 40% of the heat? You know, the little trick that the permits do, no? And basically, how to put it to production like small spaces in the, in the city. Thanks. And you see that, you know, you, you can see a little bit, you use every available resources to have multiple spaces when you can park your car, drive your laundry, grow your food, uh, or produce like different, you know, mixed animals and plants, and it maximize the, the, the possibility that the urban agriculture, for example, if you don't want to mix varieties of corn, you have to separate them almost one kilometer. But you can grow a different variety of corn because you have a 12 floor building totally blocking the, the convention with that. So there are some features in the urban space that they create like a different environment, a different niche. It's a different kind of animal, but very common. So in 1993, we signed an agreement with the Australians. I happen to be there. This is a very typical. And that's another thing. In, in the case of Cuba, the limiting factor for the agriculture, and especially for the urban agriculture, is water. Because in, uh, we have plenty of sun. And the soil I can make it, but if there is no water, I cannot invent the water. So basically, we are promoting the use of rainwaters, capturing a lot of rainwater from the from roof. We have like different spaces like ponds, and when there is some aquaculture even produced. So these are some of the projects and the actives and the, and the people. But in 1994, we re, uh, the Urban Agriculture Department of Cuba requested from the Agriculture Group that they wanted more training for their extensions on soil issues, on integrated pest management, on like different seed saving and different like they say, no problem, we can do that training. Give me one morning to do the whole permaculture. So we were infecting people with those little courses. And the first PDC was in 1995. Next. Some of the things that have the size of the cassava like six months afterwards, we started the place. So there are more than 900 people trained of which the 350 permaculture design. The permaculture is an ethical thing. So if the access to education in Cuba is universal and free, we cannot charge for a permaculture design certification. So that allows to like, choose the best people that we want to do uh, to promote as trainers. And there a network with uh, more than 100 uh, model gardens that people visit, trainers, and we try to build like an equity of genders. And also, there are four books, including the Creole from Agotri. <laughs> Creole is a word in the Caribbean world to say first generation born in the islands. And of course, now the permaculture is actually recognized by experts all over the place. This is the second stage when we, we try to appeal to like cooperation agencies from Europe and even some from Canada because you know the US doors are closed. And then we start to uh, participate in the Latin American Convergency, the power of community, and some of you may may see that was an, an American group that went to Cuba to film and we use the opportunity to promote also the, the role of permaculture. We share, you know, we did some training in, in these countries right now that people work in Venezuela and Bolivia. And the permaculture also opened as a very, very important tool for the environmental education. And that's one of the things that really can open many opportunities for in the urban agriculture. It's the, the, the environmental work. Everybody knows about green area, about environmental gardens, and so many things. But basically, in our concept of agriculture that is dealing with plants and animals, it's not only food. So 
some of the environmental responsibility in the cities can easily be performed by the urban producers. Next. So, you know, this is David Hunter, the co-creator of the term, and some of the ideas, and I can let me tell you that in November of 2013, the International the World of Culture Congress will be in Cuba, and we are invited to Next. Not only food, not only agriculture, and I think that the capacity of the agriculture in the cities to fix environmental problems is a very important possibility. Every time that we flush the toilet, we are just using from 12 to 15 liters of clean, potable water to get rid of our pests. So this is one of the most stupid human activities. But if we, if we live, you have plenty of water, baby, but we live in a country that technically with climate change is affected by drought. So every time, every compost toilet that you see, will here, that you will see here, will save 15,000 liters of water per person per year. That's 15,000 liters of water that we can use in the agriculture, but that we can use in a better city. So basically what we are promoting that compost toilets are not electric, and they are not ugly, they are not going backwards. And some people say that this is a, a very a good fertilizer. To please the Department of Public Health, we don't use that in residence. We use it in forestry and in fruit trees, so there is no contact between that thing that they ate and, 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 and what people eat, but we know it's safe. And, and the idea of that is that all of the, the compost that you're seeing, they are in the urban agricultural places, just to give the example. So in Armando Monaco, my people, instead of knocking to the neighbor, can I go to your bathroom? They have a beautiful compost toilet. And they have, they have explained to people how it works. This is some of the experience in the, in the broad acre. It's an Australian expression. I know that broad acre here is like thousands of acres. But in our case, this is more. What we will do is see the bad quality of the soil. Even the farmers leave the place, left the place in, in, a, in the 90s. And this theater group came to that place and they said, we want to live here and work here. Next. So they do their beautiful cultural work in the schools, but like the situation there, you know, it was like they wanted to do something. And they called the, the permaculture group and we started deciding the embryo of the Cuban first eco village or intentional community. Next. The training, believe me, to train actors is a little bit different than to train farmers. <laughs> Next, but it's fun. The reforestation, no more than this is one guavas. The guavas are like this, and the plant never reached two meters. And of these, we planted more than 3,000 trees, coffee on the chain of those trees, and we started to move some of, of like the, the proper, the appropriate technology. This is a biogas like yesterday. This is an efficient kitchen that will save 35 to 45 percent of the energy in the biomass. This is the porn such and this is our cold press bricks. Just to give you an example that it's not only agriculture and food, we need to create the conditions for people to live there. I know that the Cuba model, some people say, okay, Cuba is a very special place, and you're different, the things that happen there cannot happen in other places. That may be true, that may be true, but I know that the, the affairs of the world are not in a happy moment. And what, what, what happened to us can happen anywhere. The, the big difference is that we didn't have the time, the energy, and the resources, and we have to respond by uh, extreme measures to do that, which was good for the scale, but was bad because we were forced to do it. Many people have the choice to do it and the energy to do it, and I hope that they do it because societies are different. Our society reacted to food shortage, growing food. Some other societies will attack supermarkets or don't know how. So these are some of the lessons that we learned that we want to share with you. The access to land and water and resources for us became very, very important. And even more important than the ownership and the property. In our case, I'm not criticizing any case, but the idea of that is that once you have 
uh, the property of, of a, such a precious resource like land, you can do whatever you want. You can decide to develop. You can decide to do fracking for oil. You can decide to do many things that totally alienate the place for the agricultural function. And by that, we are just preventing that that happens. And the agricultural land remains agricultural land as soon as, as we can sustain. The small scale human individual farmers were four times more productive per acre and per person than any of these conventional systems. And when those systems are not subsidized, they know how hard and how expensive that is. It was necessary to do like a free market. There is a free farmer's market in Cuba, but people would go there and you know, every day. You know, the farmer's market in Cuba is open, it's uh, Mondays, it's open every day. And there are all food, period. Every kilo of food that you can produce is already sold to the next price. So it's something that really, really helped the dynamic of that. And the rest of the Cuba has 11% of the scientists of Latin America. So that allows to link this, the best of the traditional agriculture in many places to the best of the things uh, that good science can, are dealing with. And we know that is happening. The political support, the environmental concern that I explained very well, and also the diversity of food systems. We cannot put all of our eggs in the same basket. We have to have several systems. That. These are some of the little tricks that allow us to show, to share what I have shown you. It's not perfect. The system has many, many, many challenges, many, many problems. It can be perfect and it can be improved. I would like to share some of you. And I think that the most important thing is right now that we are totally convinced that every country needs farmers, those of them. And even now we have thousands of farmers, millions of farmers, we say we need more farmers. Because we need to put all the marginal lands, all the, the land when the Chua King agriculture was dismantled, uh, like this mixed uh, pasture land that they're not working properly. And for that we need new farmers and people willing to do that. We need to explore more. That's true. Now, now we are producing for the internal market, but sport is always welcome. And we don't have a national uh, system for certification, uh, organic or sustainable. It's something that we uh, need to, to work on that. So far, what is happening is that if there are people that are interested in human growth, that we know that they are biologically, and they are like, the, the buyer brings the certification, the certificate. So in that way, that put us that expense out of our box, our board. I know that you see this book here is very different. You have to pay for that, and it's expensive. But you know, we even propose that the, the certification should be very simple. You know, just test all the pros and say chemicals, not chemical free or not organic. It's very easy to try this and say that has a chemical, and, and that's what we do. Why the people that do it the things right? They have to prove that they are right. This is something that that, that can be in Cuba area that's, that's conventional, that has chemicals. We know, and and, and the other products in, in North Carolina have to be certified. And of course, our products are more in tools, or some seeds of some varieties. Our we have a biotech industry in Cuba. It's not Monsanto. But some people, they are making promises. Oh, you know, you know that this is fake. They are not doing much. But I think that this is very important, that it's a challenge, because they promise fast yields. They promise, you know, we're going to feed, and we're going to produce that. And you know that they are not producing any. They are just spreading patterns of domination of the genes, and, and, and a lot of promise on that. But some people say, no, if we are socialists, if we are different, if we apply the DMO in a good way, no, it's, it's, the environment is a it's a dead end. And this is important that even in Cuba we have our own battle with the problem with the DMO. Of course, every time that we have a hurricane, you know, we are the absolute necessity to design resilient systems. That's why there's so many products on the ground. Yam, and taro root, cassava, potato, sweet potato. You lose the plant, but you keep the root on the ground. Many of the islands, that's how they survive. Because hurricanes, now we say climate change is a big problem, but 
they were always there. So these are some are necessity that the, right now in the climate change, our agriculture needs to change. The dynamic for the first time is faster. If there is a frost in Brazil and the coffee is damaged, everybody saying, oh, the price of the coffee is good, but how long it takes to grow a tree of coffee? Seven years minimum. So by seven years, Brazil recovered already. So the, that, that dynamic needs to be re-examined. And in, in the case of like, you know, some of those systems, we really, really need to think more about that. Next. Well, <laughs> no more. No? It, it's just, I want to prove one point here. That there is not a single solution or answer to the problems that we have of the possibilities. This farmer prefers the happy pigs. That farmer prefers artificial insemination but with some many technical things. But so there are many, many ways what is appropriate in the local conditions, in the available, on the local culture, and we need to respect those values. There is no one unique thing. And we have been brainwashed that there is one only solution, the solution. Technically facilitated by fossil fuels and chemicals and machinery and exploiting and, and migrant labor and things like that. They are not. There are many, many different solutions. But the other thing is that we really have to make our way of doing things sexy. <laughs> <laughs> if it's like hard work here, you know, poor people, we would never be the, 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 the right number of people. You know? We need to learn not to sell only our approach. It's healthy, it's good. We need to sell the way of doing things. It's funny, it's sexy, it's... It, 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 it's something that deserves to be considered. And I think that this is something, because when you see a beautiful magazine selling, you know, tractors and chemicals, and then our goods maybe they're just hand-drawn and things like that. But we need to, to think that we are creating culture, we're educating people, so maybe we'll have to use some structure of that and tricks on the persuasion industry. As for well, the this is two decades uh, of this system, uh, the agricultural system of Cuba is first multi stakeholders. We have urban producers, uh, local farmers, we have even different, the potato system in Cuba is, is heavily conventional, and we have like a multi layer system that tries to complement and it can produce the food sustainable because then the ecological footprint of Cuba is 1.8 hectares. So we can produce that food with very little. Uh, expenses of energy, emissions, and, and all the things that we need to change. And that's what how when WWF reported in 2006 that Cuba requires a minimum criteria for sustainable development, we were the first people surprised. But when we saw the calculation, it's like you can produce food in millions of hectares to feed millions of, of people in fair conditions you can do that with relatively a low amount of energy and a low amount of emission and without a socially make a peace with the planet and with the environment and without socially attacking the people. And I think that the avant-garde of that was the sustainable agriculture in Cuba that is marking the way towards this sustainability for everything. Thanks a lot. that is constantly uh, collecting data. And, like, but I have to say that most of the data is more about number of hectares and yields and different of production. What happened basically that there was another process of a collective basis that we call horticulture clubs. So people in the neighborhood, they say, 
But the funny names, it wasn't the funny names, the clubs of taxi drivers. They, they're doing agriculture, but they drive a taxi. But the lawyers, so that, that creates more collective uh, like in a region. And the other thing is like, we have something that we call the cooperative for credit and services. That means that you have your plot, you have your plot, but we are part of a co that collectively help us to purchase, for example, let's rent a truck to transport the things or to bring soil. Or in the case of credit, they're very little credit, but in the case of credit, people deal together. Or in the case even that there is, there is one tractor for 40 people, what's wrong with that? We, we need that one probably once or twice a year. Why have a tractor in every farm? So the idea is like people are learning to share the knowledge, the culture, and some basic resources. And there have been a lot of different groups. The Cuban Association of Agroforestry Techniques is a not-for-profit organization. The Cuban Association for Animal Production, our foundation, and the, even a lot of church groups that they're doing like different works with, with the farmers. And the idea is like try to bring like a more horizontal systems. For example, they can be, you know, the distribution of uh, boxes for rabbits or the distribution of meters of holes or micro jet systems. The idea is not why favor one person. No, this is for the club, this is for the community, this is for the group of our, the collective. The, the, the thing is basically we have like a spread of that. And of course, a very strong system of extensions. That they, they, these extensions, they're all over from, from the Ministry of Agriculture, but their ideas is not like guarantee more production or selling a, a pesticide. The idea is that they, go, they give advice, and we have in every municipality of the country, the Casa de la Agricultura, the house of the agriculture. So that Casa will have like, you know, bibliography, seeds, broadcasting, a bachelet, or they will go to your place to see, okay, what's wrong with your avocado? That's, that was something that has been uh, in, in, li in different structures of, of the society. And the idea, of course, that is even the online that people go. And there is the solar soul programs. There is a program in television that is only for farmers. Like what happened with your grapes? What happened with this? And at the same time, also the, that have tried to be, to to balance more with the, the tradition and the culture of the farmer. People are very proud of big farmers. They don't feel that they are the bottom of the society, but they are threatened. They say they are very proud, and they dance and they do like different different like. There is there are lots of radio programs as well. And, you, and I think that the main important thing is like the social recognition that the farmer receives a provider of food for the society. It's not that they produce a commodity that what anyone can have in the no fields. It's like you need to be recognized because you are doing a noble profession and this is important for your fellow citizens. I think that that's the little trick there. Uh, last question. Uh, last question. Yes, uh, the idea is that we have like different uh, layers of system, but one thing that happens is that since we are in secondary school, we stop classes for one month or 45 days, and we go to the fields and we know how things work, and we have fun there, you know? Like some people say, no, I'm working in the fields, and, you know, that there's not. And the other thing that there is always like, in terms of like the classes of environment, the classes of history, that talks a lot how it works, and the classes are how a uh, produced food is one of the main problems of the country to satisfy basic needs. Apart from that, we have in, in mid-level technician, the IPA, the Polytechnic Agropecuary, Agricultural Institute, when people from the grade 10, they're, they're already starting to study uh, things related to the agriculture, and then, in almost each of, eight of the 60 universities of the country, you study agronomy, veterinary, uh, agriculture, and different things. And the other thing is that even the people that are more related to uh, biology and so instead of receiving only environmental sciences, they receive environmental but agriculture, and they just see that the, the, the agricultural fields are agro-ecosystems. 
So they do a lot of research there, and they learn more. And, the, and at the end of, of the studies, they're ready to be involved in the process too. Okay? Thank you. <laughs>